Artificial intelligence. That's a topic that evokes a lot of emotions. Artificial intelligence, or AI, will change the world. But what does that mean exactly? What can AI do? What is currently being researched? With direct Durchwahl, in English direct dial, straight talk about AI, the Cyber Valley podcast, we seek answers to these questions in dialogue with citizens and researchers. We are Patrick Klügel and Rebecca Beiter, Public Engagement Managers from the Cyber Valley team. Our guests don't talk about unrealistic visions of the future, but about the real questions that arise in their research. But most importantly, in our podcast, the community has its say. We ask people from the region for their perspective on the complex topic of AI. Robots or machines that can move in space, perhaps have a body, perhaps even have a body similar to that of a human. These machines have fascinated artists and engineers for quite a long time. For centuries, in fact, one must say. That's true. And our cultural history is full of such ideas in imaginations and concepts. And especially since the term artificial intelligence has become so popular, humanoid robots are often seen as the symbol of AI. So the question is, what perception of AI does society have? And this is, by the way, one of the research questions of a new initiative in the Cyber Valley ecosystem, the Red AI Center for Rhetorical Science Communication Research on Artificial Intelligence. Rebecca, do you know what happens when you type AI into Google Image Search? <laughs> well, I do have an idea, but tell me what happens. A lot of white humanoid robots occur. And indeed, they have little to do with reality and even less with intelligence, I think. Yeah, that's what I thought. And But there are some exceptions, of course. For example, in the film Baymax, the medical aid robot is soft and it looks kind of cuddly. But most of those hyper-modern white and blue images of robots unfortunately distract from the real challenges and problems in robotics and AI. Yeah, actually, there even exists, for example, an initiative that marks these so-called marketing images under the hashtag NotMyRobots. And I think even in very famous robots, such as the pre-programmed walking and jumping machines from the US company Boston Dynamics, which you might know, and which are very frightening developments from my point of view, even in those images and those machines, there's actually hardly any artificial intelligence at least with regards to machine learning or reinforcement learning algorithms. And there is one thing those machines do not have yet for sure, and that's what we want to talk about today, haptic intelligence. So robots often do not have skin or a sense of touch. But before we proceed, you might have noticed that something changed this episode, the language. It's our first episode in English. Yes, many of our researchers speak English, and that's also the language research uses to publish the findings. But not everyone speaks English, and this podcast is for a German-speaking audience. Therefore, most of our episodes will be still in German. But sometimes, when we want to talk to English-speaking scientists, some episodes will be in English in the future. But back to our topic. How does a robot feel? It can't feel emotions, but it can feel the world around it. We humans have a naturally pretty good feeling, for example, feeling heat or touch or pressure on our skin. With a robot, this gets a little bit more complicated. So I needed an expert and I talked to one, Catherine J. Kuchenbecker. She leads the Haptic Intelligence Department at the Max Planck Institute for Intelligence Systems in Stuttgart. Thank you for your time and welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here with you today. To everyone who's listening right now, I want you to concentrate on your hands. What do you feel? For example, I still feel that I just had a really heavy bag in my hand with my podcast equipment. And I feel that my hands are a little bit warmer than usual. What do you feel right now? 
Actually, my hands are a little bit cold because it's uh, winter and I keep my office a little cold to keep the energy low. But beyond that, so those ambient effects, to me, the sensations in my hands that are most fascinating are when I bring my hands into contact with objects in the world. And that's because our hands are exquisitely sensitive to all kinds of different mechanical information and all kinds of motions. And it's through our hands that we accomplish just about everything that we do in the world, whether it's picking up a glass of water to drink it, typing on a keyboard, driving a car, or hugging a loved one. All that physical interaction with the world passes through our body and through our sense of touch. And I find that really interesting, talking about what you feel with your hands. There are so many different things in mind. You can feel heat, you can locate where something is touching you. So when talking about haptics, about the sense of touch, what exactly do we talk about? I usually divide like overall haptics into two main categories. And the first is tactile or cutaneous things, things you feel in your skin. So your skin is there to protect what's inside your body and like cushion impacts, but it also is, is enervated, which means it has little cells, mechanoreceptors, thermoreceptors, pain receptors that measure and detect what's happening and uh, physically, um, whether it's, it's, it, the air is like cooling you or something is pressing or hurting hurting you or vibrating, shaking back and forth or shifting back and forth. And those sensations are all flowing like through your nerves, uh, through your peripheral nervous system and up uh, to your brain. And um, your brain, in the same way that all the little uh, parts of an image that you see are put together for a coherent impression, your brain is like making sense of this constant flood and stream of all the different tactile sensations. The other half of haptics is more about motion. Where is your body in space? Um, where are your fingers? Are they bent or are they stretched out? If you curl your hand around, say, a spoon, there's both the pattern of the spoon and the coldness and the edges um, against your skin. And there's also what is the configuration? How are my fingers shaped around it? And, and maybe am I squeezing hard or is someone pulling it out of my hand? So more the forces that's deeper in your body. Um, and those are the two main halves and they all work together to both give you control over your body to accomplish what you want and help you understand the things that you're touching and doing in the world. I think those examples with our hands gave us a first idea of how complex um, haptic intelligence, the name of your department, actually is. So to sum it up, your department is at the intersection of robotics and machine learning. Is that about right? That's close. I might say... We maybe we use machine learning in many aspects of our work, but I might say we're at the intersection of robotics and maybe human computer interaction we or, or human technology because a lot of the pro devices and studies that we're doing, we're also trying to do basic curiosity driven fundamental research to give some insights about how humans and human sense of touch work and then do in like simultaneously trying to endow robots with a sense of touch. And machine learning runs through both of those sides, um, as do many other tools like sensors or signal processing or statistical analysis. We use uh, or experiment design. Um, we, do, we use a, a wide variety of methods to investigate uh, research topics at this intersection, I say, maybe of autonomous systems, robots, and how technology can support humans. So when you're at a party, how do you briefly explain to someone who is not a scientist at all, what exactly are you researching right now? Sometimes I give an example, like sometimes people have seen in the press uh, some of the projects we've done. One is Huggybot, uh, a robot that uh, can do can give a human hugs and they're comfortable and reactive and maybe can help you calm you down. Um, I want to stay with this example for a bit because I think that's really interesting. So you have a robot here who just hugs people. Why should it do that? Well, there are often multiple reasons. One is 
by creating an artificial system that simulates or replicates an interaction that humans have um, that is highly beneficial, like hugs are known to hugely benefit people. They calm you down, they lower your stress, they decrease your cortisol levels, increase your oxytocin. This is part of what's why the pandemic has been hard, where we've had to physically distance from our loved ones or our friends or our family members far away. We haven't been able to get um, much physical contact with other people. And that's a natural human need, both when we're babies and children, and even as uh, most adults uh, get a lot of satisfaction out of hugging. So by creating a hugging robot and adjusting how it behaves, uh, we can test out which factors are truly important. Throughout all the tests we did, people much preferred hugging the robot when it was soft and warm. It was much more comfortable. Then we also varied how it physically reacted. We programmed it to, as soon as it put its arms around you, let go immediately or let go only when you let go, sort of respect your wishes or hold on longer beyond when you were ready to hug. And that last one especially really annoyed, irritated people. Uh, after we got a lot of user comments, we, we programmed the robot also to, as it's holding you, um, to proactively squeeze you gently occasionally. And that was amazing in how positively people responded. They felt like the robot really cared about them. If we build a robot today with our technology today, would a sense of touch be as good as a human one? Definitely not. Uh, there are huge limitations that we're working with as roboticists, uh, especially when we're trying to do haptic interaction. So first of all, Most robots, whether it's a robot in a factory or maybe a robot that's helping in a hospital delivering things, it has almost no sense of touch. It almost now always has uh, cameras and can see the world around it, maybe other kinds of sensors, certainly a network connection, access to data. And often it has more the second kind of haptic perception, which is its own body pose. It knows like if it has an arm, like what uh, angle its elbow is at or what angle its hand is at. So this is more like proprioception. And it, maybe it knows like, okay, the elbow is like contracted or like flexing really hard or, but it has no tactile cues, no, almost no skin. And that's because it's uh, very expensive and difficult to fabricate artificial skin um, to make it both sensitive and robust to bring things when things touch each other they tend to get damaged especially if they're little wires or connectors or and we want skin to be soft and sensitive and sense many things I, I personally over my career have found great benefit from measuring not just is something touching me and where, but the the fast, like the vibrations, the transients, the changes, like texture sliding over your skin or something slipping. And actually that happens really fast. And so we need a lot of measurements in every second. And just building that and having it fit just on the skin of the robot on the outside and streaming all that data, that's the first problem. The second is if we have all that data, we don't even know what to do with it. Uh, what does it mean? How do, how do we make sense out of all that haptic data? So We are working on different aspects of that by inventing new tactile sensors and integrating them with robots and then working. This is where we start to use machine learning to interpret the measurements that our sensors acquire. But if the human skin is already better than anything we can build right now, why should we build it? We humans are already really good at touching. Shouldn't we just do the job the robot should do? Well, humans can do many jobs, um, but some jobs are maybe dangerous for humans. There are environments, uh, let's say there's a disaster rescue, a disaster site, radiation or deep, deep under the ocean or that are dangerous or, or perhaps the task itself, you can do it, you could do it once, but if you're going to do it thousands of times, this might be harmful. My father is a surgeon and over his entire lifetime, his wrists and hands have started hurting because he's done repetitive motions. And robots tend to be good um, at once it's learned in a controlled environment to do something, um, to do it over and over. And that's not always the most stimulating or interesting job for a human. So I often look at a human and a robot working together as a team and which aspects of this problem can the, is a human really well suited to and where could we automate or um, have a robot help and can we automate pieces of it uh, but still there's in my systems usually a human is still overall in control of what's happening and i think that's a really important ethical question when talking about human machine interactions 
Um, for example, the Hagi bot seems like something people can have an emotional connection to. And I think that's a question we have to answer. Do we want machines to be as human-like as possible? And, or do we want a new way of interacting with machines so we are not that much emotionally connected to something without feelings or emotions? When we ha bring people into our lab, so recently we ran a study with 57 everyday adults here in the Stuttgart region, English speaking, because my research team is in English and we are very international. Uh, we never deceive them. They don't think the robot, I mean, maybe they do imagine the robot is smart, but it's just a machine. They know it's got a camera and it has arms and we actually don't try to make it look like a human. And sometimes people there, especially when it's about tactile contact, you can look at something and maybe try to imagine, but most of us have never hugged a robot before. This is the first robot of its kind. And I think you really have to try it to understand what it's like and, um, and then pay attention. Is this something I like or not? And the vast majority of people actually do enjoy, and they're often surprised. We give them the option of, we say, you have to hug at least once, and then you can Get, redeem as many hugs as you want and you can hug for as long as you want and in our studies people actually hug much longer maybe like 20 seconds whereas a typical hug with a friend is only two or three seconds long we compared directly to also hugging with a human because people were really curious and of course i think a human is mechanically like nicer to hug than the robot it's more reactive softer more compassionate but then you have many people mentioned feeling guilty about the woman we had hired, the actress, to hug them, and that she might feel imposed upon or uncomfortable at how long they would want to hug. And with a robot, you don't have that, you don't have to worry about how the robot feels. You can just, if I need a short hug or a long hug, I can just get that for myself. Um, I want to go a little bit deeper into the workflow or the problems of your field right now. So the first haptical intelligent uh, robots, they were for example, for um, deactivating a bomb. And you still had some joysticks in your hand to navigate the robot. Now we are a little bit more along the way. So what exactly are you researching on when, with haptical intelligence right now? Yeah, so one topic that we work on um, actually quite a lot is called tele-operation, remote control of a robot. And this is where, of course, a dangerous environment or another um, application we work a lot on is robotic surgery, where we want a surgeon to be able to operate on, inside a human body, but without needing a big incision to get their big hands and eyes inside the body, but through long, thin instruments that are always controlled by the surgeon. But we want those, in, or another application area, Uh, I'm part of the excellence cluster in CDC here at the University of Stuttgart and at our institute. And we are working on bringing robotic technology, AI and digital technology into construction sites where, again, there are big machines that often people control with a joystick. Like basically there's a knob or a switch where I have to rotate the robot, the crane's elbow or the digger's elbow or move this. It's rather awkward. It's not fluid. It's not as easy. You have to think really hard. You have to learn and you have to kind of do it step by step instead of all fluid moving more than one joint at once. In construction or bomb disposal, um, maybe more outdoor dangerous environments, there's still room for improvement on the motion mapping. And that's actually part of the work we're doing in the excellence cluster is we want to, um, we're working on a, gener a general algorithm that actually uses optimization to map how a human moves to how a robot moves and be able to um, kind of automatically make the robot copy what the human's doing in a very natural way without you having to train and practice uh, a lot. Haptile Interaction is one way to interact with a robot, but you can also use, for example, speech. Mm -hmm. So um, isn't it easier to just make the robot or the, the surgical robot um, react to what you're saying it should do? Well, we had surgeons be able to talk to the robot to like bring up different tools. For example, we used augmented reality and computer vision, um, and actually we used a machine learning algorithm that someone else created and, and shared open source, which we're really grateful for, for example, to see are the instruments in view or not and warn them if they're moving their tools out of view because that's dangerous or to measure different structures. And actually the surgeons were not good at all at guessing how big something is compared to accurately measuring the size so they could maybe decide how big of an implant to put in. But their hands are completely busy while they're doing these tasks. And so we used voice to say, uh, Da Vinci compute distance or um, to turn on and off the different functionality. So 
I would say voice is good for a more cognitive, like think of the ways you use voice uh, and maybe summoning information or turning on um, modes. But manipulation, it's, it seems counterintuitive to humans because you're so, we're all so good at things. Like if I give you a task of like chopping up a carrot, um, it is actually much easier for a robot to hear you say, robot, please chop the carrot, versus actually physically chopping the carrot is, I would say, a thousand times harder given current technology than understanding the words, robot, please chop the carrot. Um, because... The carrot chopping, you have first you have a dangerous thing, a knife, and a a, a material, this carrot, this natural material, vegetable that is different every time. And I have to move through the air and then slice through the carrot. And that's yeah, way harder. <laughs> so the haptic intelligence, we haven't yet mastered nearly to the level of um like speech. Although there's still, of course, good work and interesting work happening in speech uh, or even visual perception. I think for robots, um, a robot, an autonomous system or an agent intelligent system can look at the world and better understand what it's seeing compared to touching things and understanding what it's feeling or manipulating objects in the world. And I think that's really interesting because... Um That's such a normal human sense. We have it covered in all of our body. And when I looked at your department areas and saw one is called understanding tactile contact, I was a little bit surprised because I thought we humans already have understood what touch actually is <laughs> because it's such such a basic yeah. thing. I would say we take our sense of touch for granted because like it, we, it's always there. Your sense of touch almost is never turns off. It's very rare compared... Uh, I mean, losing your sense of vision, losing your sense of hearing, um, it, 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 those are disabilities, but you, people can learn to live. It's very rare for your sense of touch. It's so fundamental. It's throughout your body. It's not just in one local area. Um, and coping with a loss of the sense of touch, even think about how clumsy you become if your hand goes to sleep or you have Novocaine, maybe if at the dentist and they apply an anesthetic locally, you almost cannot talk or drink because you don't have this feedback of how your body is moving, which is tightly connected to like how you, how you activate your muscles compared to how the motion is happening or what you're touching. So I guess it's like maybe a uh, touch is an underappreciated sense because We're all so good at it through practice. Um, and babies and children gain this experience through through practice and through experience. And it takes years uh, for, uh, I mean, I would not trust my four-year-old niece to chop a carrot. It's a, she might chop her finger off <laughs> and, it, and control the forces that high. I mean, we're working on Legos, assembling Legos properly. <laughs> But that's a good um, part where we can um, ask a question. What exactly is the intelligent part about haptic intelligence? So where does the AI or machine learning come into part? Yeah, so the AI and machine learning tends to come in more in interpreting the signals, like what, what, what you might call like a traditional AI or machine learning. So once we have acquired, like there are now I have sensor on a robot, say a particular kind of fingertip sensor, how do I make sense of that, understand what, what, what's happening? Because... Um, The sensor, usually the readings, you might be all these voltages or these, um, the, the, and, a button, and they don't map one to one to like a little force vector at each point. There's some transformation. It's often nonlinear and complicated. Uh, we, I have a long-term collaboration with Georg Martius, who's a group leader in the tubing inside of our institute, where we're with his PhD student, Juan Bo Sun, making a camera-based uh, tactile sensor that has a camera inside the robot finger, and it's looking inside the soft shell and seeing how the deformations happening are happening and then can output where the forces are happening and in which direction they're pushing. And Juan Bo and Garrick programmed a deep neural network to do that transformation end to end from pixels to this um, dense 3D force map. Uh, and so that's where these like pattern recognition um, capabilities of machine learning really help. The word haptic intelligence I chose for the name of my department Because I believe that to cre create intelligent robot systems that can truly help people, um, 
We need not only what I just said, the software side, but we also need improvements on the physical side. And so I also, my team, we're working a lot on these haptic sensors just to bring the data into the computer system. What should we be measuring? What, how can we create that in a clever way? How can we give a robot a sense of touch? Or what signals should I measure? Let's say I'm helping, we're working with a surgeon to help them learn how, help young surgeons learn how to do a task just with an instrument. I worked, I had a long-term collaboration at the University of Pennsylvania with a dentist and she was teaching new dental students how to diagnose cavities in our teeth and tell which tooth is healthy, which tooth is not. And it's based on what they feel as well as what they see with their eyes and in the x-rays. So this is a different, more the human kind of haptic intelligence. And to help people learn those skills, we have to figure out what should we measure and how can we help people improve, especially these expert skills, or we also work some with um, patients who've had like um, need to recover from say a stroke or spinal cord injury. Like how can we help people recover their physical capabilities after they've lost them? Okay. So what we discussed so far is part of many interdisciplinary fields. So for example, mechanical engineering or biomedical engineering, but also computer science and cognitive science. So if we have listeners who think, oh, that's really interesting, maybe I can get into haptical intelligence, what should they study? You should always follow your heart. Um, I think try a few things early in your career if you can. Uh, maybe talk to people you know, who, someone who's a computer scientist, maybe a friend of your family is an engineer, or and ask them what they do. Maybe try to shadow them at their workplace. I think I could have been very happy as a computer scientist studying or as an uh, electrical engineer, as a biomedical engineer, or as a mechanical engineer. And I actually, all of my degrees are in mechanical engineering, but I always took a lot of classes in these other disciplines that I mentioned. And while I was a professor, I also had a secondary appointment in computer science um, and I had PhD students and master's students in electrical engineering and biomedical engineering. My team here is extremely diverse. It's good to have a core set of competencies. So choose a field, what might... I mean, if the mechanical things make more sense to you or bring you more joy or the electrical things or the programming things, how do you want to spend your time? You want to have like a core competence, but then some breadth. Um, a professor I really uh, look up to at, at Stanford, he was an entrepreneurship professor, Tom Byers, he used to tell us you should try to be T-shaped, like the letter T, broad, but then in one area deep, like the vertical part of the T. And you can choose your specialization, but you need to be able to speak to the other experts um, in relevant areas so you can really build complex systems that are not only mechanical, say, but also have, or, or not only a computer program, but to me, it's very meaningful to create these integrated systems. It's complicated, it's tricky, but it's also fascinating. So that was my interview with Catherine J. Kuchenbecker. There was a lot of interesting information and if you want to read it again, on our website cyberminusvalley.de we will publish a blog post with the written interview as soon as this episode airs. Patrick, did you learn something new while listening to it? Of course. I mean, to be honest, most of it was new to me. And in the first place, I was thinking a lot about what those findings should or could be applied to. But then I was um, much more surprised that we are still at the beginning of something like an artificial haptic intelligence. Yeah, I thought that too. And since the interview, I also notice much more often all the things I feel with my skin, um, where I feel pressure or how my clothes feel, for example. I've never noticed that before. It's exciting that I've taken it for granted so far. But now I'm also excited to hear the public perspective on this theme. Who do you talk to, Patrick? I'm so sorry that I couldn't find a citizen on short notice that uh, was prepared to give me her or his view on robotics in English this time. But I did talk to another very interesting person, to someone who deals with those future issues in an artistic way and also in a very physical way. I am Ilya Mirski. I work as a dramaturg at the Institut für Theatrale Zukunftsforschung uh, in the Zimmertheater Tübingen. If you would translate it into English, it would be something like Institute for Performative Future Research or for Theatrical Futurology at the Zimmertheater Tübingen. And um, I have a background in cognitive science and uh, in performance studies and right now I'm also doing a PhD about human AI interaction 
on theater stages in Tübingen and at the Zurich University of the Arts. Yeah, I am very happy to talk to you about uh, some thoughts and things I am and we are working as a theater on. So what do you find so fascinating about human-machine interaction? I realize that there is really a lot in human-machine interaction if you pursue a creative approach towards human-machine interaction. So basically, I would say that technology always triggers human behavior. So every time we as humans interact with technology, it does something with us, not only in a cognitive level, but also on a level of how do we interact. For example, the smartphone introduced a new way of interacting with the touch display. Uh, sometimes you can see little children interacting with TV screens, which are not touch screens. And there you really can like learn a lot about how we people interact and how our body, how our uh, fingers Our uh, movements uh, tell something about our approach towards uh, technology. I think we as humans, we often underestimate our abilities in regard to cognition, in regard to imagination, to creativity, but also to communication. Every time I start creative processes with machines, I um, search for the limits of the machines. So where the, does the machine stops working? Where is it unpredictable and where starts a, like a creative way of interacting with a machine? For example, if it comes to VR uh, or virtual reality or augmented reality, uh, it's very interesting to watch people, how they get really curious about exploring the virtual space, about looking under the tables, um, behaving in a way they don't behave in a normal daily regulated life. I would say in our daily life, curiosity is often limited. And I see that machines often help us to be more curious about understanding our world and our environment. And what role can theater play in all this? I used to work with uh, people with disabilities and there I saw that it's really not easy to get into uh, interaction with machines because there are certain no norms, uh, certain um, rules people have to obey to interact with a machine. So um, the basic approach of uh, the theater I'm working in is to develop plays um, by thinking about which topics, which subjects, um, what kind of contents really matter now. So we really start in, in our daily life and we think about uh, philosophical questions, about, of course, artificial intelligence and machine learning. We uh, therefore always um, talk to experts in those areas. Um, for us, theater is kind of a social space and uh, it's a space where we can think about how we want to live in the future, how we think about certain topics, about certain philosophical uh, questions or ethical questions or the technology. What comes to your mind when you think of our future with machines? What do you hope for or what fears do you maybe have? There are many bad, uh, bad things which can happen, but it really matters whether the machines still have got a um, power off button or not. I um, am convinced that we humans will dominate how we use machines, how we interact with them. And as long as we as humans are aware of the fact that we can say no and the machine stops or we can switch a machine off, everything should be fine. Okay, and what should or what can we as humans learn from machines? I try always to be a positive person and a very optimistic one. And um, I really think that machines can help us being more creative, but it really it matters how we reflect on those machines and how we reflect on those interactions. Um, for example, uh, if it comes to the topic of talking to machines, 
I am sure that in a few years, yeah, it will be okay to talk to, uh, to talk to machines um, or to Siri, even if other people are listening to it. So uh, machines, they will be also kind of acting on the stage and acting is also very wide word acting might be also just standing there or acting might be going from left to right and doing nothing or acting might be cleaning up the stage i mean there are many many possibilities we at the theater we have got uh, vacuum cleaning robots and we sometimes like make jokes about them we just want to put them on the stage and making like a robo ballet and watching them doing crazy things because i think there's really something in it it's really about uh, things with, that move things we can interpret something into their behavior into um, how they interact how also we or for example how a human actor might interact with a machine in a setting where really all the audience has to pay attention to this interaction because most of the times those interactions are just like not central for our daily life because machines are understood as little helpers. But if you put them on a theater stage, it really can be something. And this might be interesting. What do machines or robots lack to be a good actor or actress? I think robots can learn a lot from actors. And it's, I mean, for me, it's the concept of present, how to act in a way so everyone is watching you or how to create a certain tension between you and the viewers. And um, this is uh, from a theatrical or uh, a scientific side, very interesting because it's very hard to explain what, what makes, uh, what uh, creates this feeling of being present. Uh, I think the chances that if robots could learn about those, this concept, we could understand better, first of all, what this concept means but also what it means to create an atmosphere so everyone can pay attention to something. And this would be very interesting because I'm really curious if it's possible to simulate it and also how to simulate it and really what, what's in it uh, that makes us uh, so fascinating about something being present. What is the danger of robots having total control over their bodies? First, I think that it's very hard to create kind of the concept of a body. A human like really needs time to, to learn about the human body, about the abilities, about what's possible, what's not possible. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, every time I put VR goggles onto a person, if it's a, like a dancer or an actor, um, and it's the first time like the person has got a VR headset on. Like after a, a few seconds, the person says, oh, I don't have a body anymore. So it's really interesting. And um, if I wait like a couple of more minutes, usually the dancer is laying on the floor with the VR headset on and looking into the sky and like doing really crazy movements. And most of the people who uh, are not dancers or actors don't do stuff like this and they don't say uh, like that they don't have a body yeah this is something Catherine also talks about in the interview she explained how important it is to have this haptic intelligence to feel like we have a body and a beginning and a end of ourselves was there anything in particular in the interview that sparked your interest I was really uh, fascinated about the, the Huggy bot and also about the experiments uh, she told in the interview because especially the, the one thing when the Huggy bot is uh, hugging you even stronger after you don't want to hug it anymore makes me curious because this is something, I would say it's a um, way of unpredictability in a way. You as a human would anticipate that if you stop hugging something, the other person or the other, other robot also would stop hugging you. Um, I thought, I mean, I, I, um, one of my first thoughts about the interview was, what would it be if you could connect like a natural language processing or text to speech uh, algorithm and then the um, huggy bot is telling you how the hug feels. So um, also making the robot talking about how it 
feels to hug you would uh, would be very interesting and yeah i really would would love to like uh, get to know Hagibot. what i found very impressive was how optimistic Ilya is about all these things he's curious and he's almost enthusiastic about the future possibilities he sees in human machine interaction and as you heard he also really wanted to test the Hagibot ones what gave me food for thought was the question of the concept of a body he raises so what does it actually mean to have a soft and a living body with the boundary that separates us from others but at the same time must be of course very permeable so in the end i thought wow how robotics can make the incredible value of being human very very clear to us that was my learning in the end and with that we got to the end of this episode If you want to stay up to date with all our public engagement activities, for example, our workshops and more, you can subscribe to our public engagement newsletter on our website, cyber-valley.de slash newsletter. We will put the link in our show notes for those who are interested. Our next episode for the Cyber Valley podcast Direktdurchwahl will be in German again. And it will be a special episode for our five years anniversary. So stay tuned and thank you for listening. Bye. Bye-bye.